okay so let's uh, get started so today's topic is uh, repeated games uh, with incomplete information i am teaching this topic through a democratic process last time we did a poll and people want to know what repeated games with incomplete information looks like so i want to start with three examples uh, and the setting is as follows for the entire series of le so entire lecture p1 is the role player and is the maximizer p2 is the column player and is the minimizer okay so whatever matrix i am going to draw p1 the role player wants to maximize it p2 wants to minimize it so here is uh, the first setting so so the setting is as follows uh, we have set of states uh let's say capital let's say 1 to capital k and uh, a probability distribution mu in delta capital k so this is the probability distribution over the states uh, p1 knows knows the state p2 does not so you can think of it think of the set of states as the private information of player 1 and p2 doesn't have access to the private information of player 1 okay and they are playing a game uh, and the cost function or the utility function depends on u is a function of k uh, action of first player and the action of second player okay this is the utility for player 1 so by definition it's the cost for player 2 and of course the strategy space so gamma 1 uh is going to map so so right now i'm focusing on static game but then i'll move on to dynamic game so gamma 1 is the set of all functions from 1 to capital k to uh delta m and then gamma 2 is is just in delta n okay so this is the set of probability distributions over player 2's action set 1 to n and this is the set of probability distributions this is the set of probability distributions over play, player 1's action set a1 okay so delta m equals to probability distribution over a n a1 and delta n is equal to set of probability distribution over a2 Okay so you can think of this as vector and you can think of gamma 1 as a matrix whereas gamma 2 is a vector So so I'm considering a static game so there is no dynamic so there is no dynamic so far uh player 1 knows the state player 2 does not and the set of states is 1 to k okay finite it's it's completely a finite game So the first example I want to consider is the following uh k is equal to 2 game 1 is this with probability so mu 1 equals to half and mu 2 equals to half okay So this game is played with probability one half. This game is played with probability one half. Only player one knows which game he or she is playing. So this is uh, top bottom L R top bottom L R. So my question to you is. uh let's say this game was being played repeatedly okay so now we are in the dynamic games uh, part and what player 1 says is well if i look at this game this one this one is a weakly dominated strategy so this one gives you a better payoff to player 1 so player 1 will play t all the time 
if player 1 is playing this game and player 1 will play B all the time if player 1 was playing this game. Okay? So what would player, do, player 2 do in return in the dynamic setting? So P1 says play T all the time if uh, k is equal to 1, play <coughs> b all the time if k is equal to 2. What happens at the first instant? If player 1 has declared the strategy, okay, this is my strategy, what is player 2 going to do? Well, player 2 is going to say, remember player 2 is a minimizer, okay? So player 2 is going to say, so suppose, suppose this was the game that player 1 is playing. Okay, player 2 doesn't know what game he is playing. So he is going to just act randomly at the first time instant. But then he observes that player 1 is going to play, player 1 is playing T or play T at the first time instant. So he knows that this is the game they are playing and he will start acting according to R from time 2 onwards. And same thing here, if player, if player 1 was playing this game, then player 2 will see that he is acting according to strategy B at the second time step and then player 2 will switch his strategy to whatever strategy he was playing, he will switch his strategy to playing L all the time. Okay? So player 1 in some sense reveals the information, the state information that he had okay, to player 2 within one time step. Okay? Second time step onwards player 2 knows exactly what player 1 is playing what the state with player 1 is. So this is in some sense a signaling. Okay? Remember in signaling the idea was player 1 has some information, player 1 takes an action and then player 2 takes an action right? and this action and player 2 by looking at the action wants to get some information about uh, this player, player 1. Right? So this was the setup in signaling game, if you remember. And this is exactly what is happening in a dynamic setting here. Okay? Player 1 knows the state. Player 2 looks at the action that is taken by player 1 at time 1. And then player 2 will thereafter take an action because it knows the information exactly. Yes? Yes. So player 2 doesn't know the state, but player 2 knows the distribution and player 2 knows how many states are there. Okay. So player 1 through its, through its action signals the information to player 2. Okay. And then player 2 will know what state they are in and then it will adjust its strategy accordingly uh, to reflect the fact that he knows due to the due to the actions of player 1 he knows exactly what game they are playing so for player 1 it is better to act according to some other strategy which doesn't reveal the information to player 2 so let's see what that what that strategy looks like so p1 says p1 disregards information and plays according to the mean game. So if you find out the mean of this game, it is one half zero zero one half, right? So that's the mean, mean. So this is mu one multiplied by this matrix plus mu two multiplied by this matrix. So that's this matrix. Okay. And what's the what's the strategy for player one? So gamma one star one half one half gamma two star equals one half one half. Okay. That's the that's the uh, equilibrium, saddle point equilibrium for this mean game. 
And if you look at the payoff, player one gets a payoff of one fourth all the time. Okay? Whereas in this game, player one was getting a payoff of zero all the time. So P1 was getting, so value was equal to zero and value is equal to one fourth. What happens in the first few time steps is not, not relevant for the entire game because once you take the average, the first few steps don't matter. So by disregarding the information, player one is able to achieve a higher payoff in this game as compared to in this game where it was using its, its information. Is this, in this problem, is it a state changing or is it just some fixed state? That so that's a good point. Are the strategies changing with respect to time based on the information they are receiving? It so turns out that for the infinite horizon game, the strategies don't change. Okay. Uh, of course, for finite horizon, the strategies might change a little bit, but uh, you will get epsilon close to this value if you use this strategy. Okay, so disregarding information was, was very good in this particular game. Let's look at another example. Yeah. So he is, uh, is it important that player two knows that player one disregarded the information that he has? Yes, so player two will, so if player two knows that this is the game they are playing, in the sense that, uh, I mean player two knows what the payoff is and what the states is and what the distribution of the states is and so on. So as soon as the information about this game is made public, player two knows that player one is bluffing. Okay? So player two will take into account the fact that he is bluffing and he is going to adjust his strategy accordingly. Okay, so, so let's look at uh, another game where it's the same player, but now I have the payoff matrices slightly differently. Okay, mu1 equals to one half, mu2 equals to one half. Okay, so that's the game. Uh, so how should player one react? Uh, how should player one act in this particular game? So let's look at the mean game. What's the mean game? minus one half zero minus one half so so the saddle point equilibrium for the mean game would still remain the same one half one half and one half one half and the value is going to be negative one fourth okay so the value is minus one over four for this mean game and in this mean game player one is not using player one is disregarding its information Okay, so this is the value it is getting. Let's see if player one uses the information and says that well, he's going to play B in this game and he's going to play T in this game. Okay, what's the payoff that he gets? If he's playing this game, he's going to play B all the time. If he's going to play this, if he's playing this game, he's going to play T all the time. Then the payoff, the value is equal to zero. Okay, and in the process, player one has completely revealed which game or what its information is to player two. Okay, so this is completely revealing information to P2. And of course, in that process, he's getting a better payoff for himself. So what we have here is our two games. In one game, 
it's optimal for player one to disregard the information. In this game, it is optimal for player one to use its information, reveal the information through its action in the, in the repeated game. So those are the two extremes where you are completely revealing or completely disregarding the information. There is a third part where you reveal some part of the information to the other player. So let's look at that game and I'm going to write it here itself. So the payoff matrices are example 3, 4, 0, 2, 4, 0, minus 2, zero four minus 2, 4, 2. Okay, and without going into too much detail, here is what the uh, what the uh, strategy is. Gamma one star at k equals one is equal to three over four, one over four, and gamma two star sorry sorry gamma one star at k equals two is going to be 1 over 4, 3 over 4. And the players are going to play as follows. Uh, and by the way, I want to write it. The action A, T is going to be equal to A1. And in this case also, A, T is going to be equal to A1. So, so uh, Player 1's action at all time steps is going to be the same as player 1's action at the initial time step. And the same thing here, player 1's action at all time step is going to be the same as player 1's action at the initial time step. But how do you get the initial action? Well, you take a lottery according to this particular fashion, or with this probability distribution. So, so if this was the state of player 1, player 1 is going to toss a coin Okay, and with probability 3 over 4, he's going to take an action T all the time. And with probability 1 over 4, he's going to take an action B all the time. Okay, and same thing here. It turns out that this is the Nash equilibrium for, uh, or saddle point equilibrium for this infinite game. Uh, but it doesn't reveal complete information about the state. And why do I say so? So let me look at the belief over k given the action t of player 1. So what is that? That's probability of t given k equals 1 or k equals 1 into probability of k equals 1 over summation probability of k equals i, probability <coughs> of k equals i, i equals 1 to 2. Okay, and if you do this computation, it turns out to be equal to 3 over 4. Okay, so so what's happening in this game? Well, let's say this was the state, and player one acted according to t. Okay, but because he acted according to t using a mixed strategy, 
Player two doesn't know for sure whether he's playing this game or whether he's playing this game, right? But his belief has changed, right? Remember what the prior probability was is one half, one half, but the posterior probability is three fourth. That it's with probability three four, he's playing this game. With probability one fourth, he's playing this game. Okay, that's what player two is thinking. Okay, and based on that, it will adjust his strategy and it will give him the, I mean, it will give player one the best payoff and player two the best cost possible. Okay, so this is, uh, I want to, so the prior was mu, which was one half, one half, posterior, which is pi, which is 3 over 4, 1 over 4, assuming the player 1 acted according to t. If p1 acted t at step 1. Okay? So all of you know what the difference between prior and posterior is. Okay, prior is the distribution when you don't have information. Posterior is the updated distribution uh, based on whatever information you have received. So this is the information that player two did not know. Okay, so the prior is equal to mu. And when player two saw that player one is acting according to this uh, strategy T all the time, it updated its belief that with probability three fourth, he's playing this game and with probability one fourth, he's game, playing this game. So this is partial revelation, their belief of player two has changed because of the action of player one. Okay, so I have noted some of the key ideas in this class of repeated games with incomplete information. When do you disregard the information? When do you completely reveal the information? And when do you partially reveal the information, okay, in these games? So what we will, in order to understand the value of repeated games, what we want to understand first is the value of this non-revealing strategy, okay, value with non-revealing strategy. So let's study that. So, so I'm going to define n r of mu as the set of gamma one such that or gamma one from k to or one to k k to delta m such that gamma 1 k equals to constant for all k satisfying mu k greater than 0. Okay, so if a state occurs with positive probability, all values of gamma ones at those states that occur with positive probability have to be the same. Okay, so that's uh, that's nr of mu non-revealing strategy at prior probability mu. So this is the set of non-revealing strategies. Why is it non-revealing? Because if I look at the action, if player one acts according to this strategy and I look at the action of player one, if I'm the player two and I look at the action of player one, and I try to form a belief, my belief is going to be equal to mu, okay? So pi will be equal to, if P1, P1 uses gamma one in nr mu, 
then pi is equal to mu. Posterior belief is the same as prior belief. Okay, so player one does not did not reveal any information to player two about the state of the game. Okay, and then what is the value? So let's consider the game. So in the original game, uh, players were, I mean, uh, strategy space, space of player one was gamma one from the set one to k to delta m. I'm going to define this non-revealing game in which the strategy space of P1 is taken to be N, N, R, mu. Okay? And N, R, mu is a compact convex set compact convex set. Okay, not very hard to prove. So for every mu, if you look at the set NR mu, which is defined here, it's a compact and a convex set. Well, it's a closed convex set in a compact space, so therefore it's a compact convex set. Okay, so I'm I have the original game where my strat where the strategy space of player one is very large. I have this NR game, which is non-revealing game, where player one is restricted to use only non-revealing strategy. Okay? And let me call the value of this game to be V of mu. And the value of this game will be whatever. I, I don't care what the value is actually. Okay, but for this non-revealing game where I'm restricting the strategy space of player one, I'm going to call it, I'm going to give it a name. The value is given by V, which is a function of mu. That's the value of this game. Why would a value exist in this game? Can someone tell me? What theorem we have studied to prove that a value would exist in this game? Yeah, what was the theorem's name? Mm -hmm. It's Rosen's theorem. Rosen's theorem. Because the strategy space of P1 is compact. Okay, compact convex set. The strategy space of P2 is delta, delta N, right? In this case, the strategy space of P2 is also delta N. So strategy space of P1 is a compact convex set. Strategy space of P2 is a compact convex set. If you look at the payoff function, it's linear in the class of uh, in, in their strategies, okay, it's affine, so it's a concave function in particular, or, or convex function, and therefore it's a, a, a value would exist by Rosen's theorem. So value exists by Rosen's theorem. Okay, the proof of it is uh, fairly standard, so it's an exercise, you can try it out in your Thanksgiving break or Christmas break. Okay, but it's not, not important. Okay, all you need to know is that the value exists in this particular game, even though you have restricted the strategy space of P1. And I'm going to give it a name, V of mu. So in this particular game, how do I compute V of mu? Let me consider the game in which in which the let me consider the game in which player one doesn't use any any of its information so i'm just going to sum mu k 
with a as a function of k. A, a k is this matrix. So this is my a1 and this is my a2. So this is equal to for arbitrary mu. So I'm not going to take mu1. Let me call it mu1 equals to p and mu2 equals to 1 minus p. So what do I have here? p 0, 0, 1 minus p. What's the saddle point equilibrium of this game? So the saddle point equilibrium is 1 minus p, p. Yeah, and 1 minus p, p. Okay. So this is a static game, right? This is just a very basic game, static game. And this is the saddle point equilibrium for this particular game. And the value at mu is equal to p multiplied by 1 minus p. Remember, p is mu 1. So p is mu 1. Okay. So that's the value of this particular game. And you can do the same thing for other games that we have studied. So, so let me let me draw the value. So v of mu is very important for studying the repeated game. Okay, so. For example, 1, v of mu, as we have calculated, is mu 1, 1 minus mu 1. And if you look at the figure, this is your mu 1, or p, it looks like, what does it look like? It looks something like this. This is 1, this is 0. Okay, it's a concave function. If you look at example 2, my v of mu would turn out to be minus mu 1, 1 minus mu 1. And so in that case, this is my v of mu, the y-axis. So this is my v of mu, and this is my mu 1, and this would look something like this. This is 0, and this is 1. OK. So that gives the entire background for understanding the repeated games part. Any questions so far? So what did we do? We started with a game in which player 1 was informed of the state, player 2 did not know what the state was. So we defined a new strategy set for player 1 in which player 1 decides to play the average game. Okay, The average game is just sum of mu k, a k. Okay, and whatever the saddle point equilibrium for that game turns out to be, that is the non-revealing strategy. Okay, so the strategy doesn't change with respect to what k player 1 is at. And so that's the non-revealing strategy for player 1. And if player 1 acts according to the non revealing so we found the saddle point equilibrium in the class of non-revealing strategies. And if player 1 acts according to NR strategy and player 2 plays the best response to the NR strategy, non-revealing strategy, then what we get is the value of the game in which player 1 was informed and player 2 was not informed. Okay? And what happens at non-revealing strategy, the beliefs do not update. I mean the beliefs of player 2 about what player 1 knows doesn't get updated over a period of time. So pi of t, which is the belief, posterior belief, based on the history of actions of player 1, it's equal to mu. 
Okay, so there's no update of belief. And that happens because player one is acting irrespective of whatever information it has. Okay, same strategy for every, for every state, for every possible case that he observes. So let's, uh, so that's what we have done so far. So let's now formulate the repeated game part. And we saw that v of mu is sometime a concave function, sometime a convex function, okay? And sometimes it could be an arbitrary nonlinear function. So you could have cases where v mu looks something like this, okay, as a function of mu. Okay, so what's the setting for repeated games? Uh, no. So, K is distributed according to mu. P1 knows K at T equals to 1. Okay, player 1's action is IT. So, let's say acts IT. P2 doesn't know, okay? So P2's action is JT, okay? And the history that player one and player two have at time T is I1, J1, I T minus one, J T minus one. Okay, so that's the history of action. The action taken by player one at time one, action taken by player two at time one, all the way up to action taken by player one at time t minus one and action taken by player two at time t minus one. So this is the same as a1 t and a2 t, okay? Um, which notation do you want me to keep? Do you want me to keep this or this? What seems more intuitive to you? Doesn't matter? Okay, so I'll just keep it and jt because it's easier to write, there's no subscript. <coughs> Player one strategy space is gamma one at time t, which maps k or one to k cross h of t to delta over m. Oh, uh, h of t, let me say this is in the space capital H of t. So and gamma 2t that maps h of t to delta n. Okay, the cost, the utility function u depends on k, i t, and j t, and I'm going to sum the utility from time t equals one to capital T, so that's the total utility player one has received over a period of time t, and I'm going to average it, so that's one over t, and then what else? I have to take an expectation. And I'm going to define it as J of gamma one, or J dependent on mu of gamma one and gamma two. Okay, gamma one is the collection So gamma one is the collection of all the strategies of player one. Gamma two is the collection, well, not strategy. I mean, gamma one itself is a strategy. These are individual control laws at time t. So gamma one is collection of all the control laws of player one. Gamma two is the collection of control laws of player two. 
and I'm taking this expected value with respect to k and with respect to the random variables i, t, and j, t, and how do you compute the distribution over i, t, and j, t using gamma 1 and gamma 2, okay? Very simple. So, and let me call v mu, v as a function of, no, v as a function of mu is already introduced. v t, oh, this is j t, j capital T, and let me call v capital T of mu as, what is this? This is the value of t stage game with prior mu. Okay, and we want to characterize the v infinity of mu, right? So we want to take the limit t going to infinity and we want to characterize what v infinity of mu looks like. So the first result, I mean the main result is, and uh, even though I'm writing it, it's very simple to understand, but it's one of the very difficult proof that I've ever encountered in the game theory literature, okay? So, very complicated proof, but very easy to write it, okay? So, so the, the result is V infinity of mu exists, so which means that if I take the limit t going to infinity and see the sequence Vt of mu, I will see that V infinity of mu exists, so the sequence converges with respect to t, and v infinity of mu equals to cav v of mu, okay? Remember, v of mu was the value of the one stage game where player one was restricted to use non-revealing strategy. What is this cav, okay? Cav is a concavification function which acts on a function. So what does that mean? I have a function like this. I have to find an upper envelope which is concave. So how do I find an upper envelope which is concave? So I go this way and at this point I break away and I go here and then I go down. Okay, so look at this function. this function, okay? This is, so this my original function was let's say f of mu, and my, this function is cav f of mu, okay? So this is the concave envelope of the function. Well, you know, mu is going to be in a compact set, delta k. Yes, it's zero, one. So, yeah, it's. And if it's like the same as you draw the on board, uh -huh. how does the orange part extend from that point? Well, uh, okay, so I'm assuming that this is the set of mu. Okay, so you say zero is. So, okay, so let's say, yeah, let's say the, the let's say this is my zero. starting point. Okay, so the option is, uh, I'll have to go this way. Okay, so in fact, I haven't defined the function f at zero, right? So I have to define the function at zero. So let's say this is what my function looks like, then mu is going to look something like this. But see, there should not be, this should be concave. It looks like convex curve, so let me make it concave. Okay, so it should, it should be concave, okay? So it should either be linear or it should be bending in this way. Okay, so this is the, cav of f comma f evaluated at mu. So if I look at, this is my mu, if I look at my mu here, see f of mu is below 
below this line, but cav of f at mu is above the point. Okay, and so what this result is saying, if you think about it carefully, your v of mu looks something like this. Okay, so let me write it as v of mu. So your v of mu looks something like this. So if you were playing a non-revealing strategy in a static game, this is your value. But because, if, but if you play it infinitely many times, this is your value. Okay, this is what player one can guarantee himself. Okay, so even though in one stage, player one had a negative value, in infinite stage, player one can get himself a strictly positive value as long as there are points at which he can get positive values. So this is similar to what we saw in the previous class where we said that in a finite game you will have a certain number of payoffs that you can get but when you play a repeated game you can expand the set of payoffs that both players can get through cooperation and through, through uh, punishments and so on. In this game, I am saying something similar. Player one, in static game, player one can guarantee himself only this much amount of value. But in infinite game, player one has expanded the amount of values, uh, the, has been able to maximize the value it can get by doing some funny stuff. Okay, and we will see what that funny stuff is. Okay, any questions so far? Yes. At the first stage, uh, we draw k out of mu, right? So we pick one of the games. Right. Of the, and is it fixed until then? Yes. Okay. So once it's fixed, oh. remember u of u depends on k, but k doesn't change with time, right? So it's the same game that you are playing over and over again. Um, very recently, as recent as 2014, there has been a paper where k depends on time. Okay, but. I can't read the paper, okay? It's extremely difficult to read because there are just so many complicated theorems that are being used to solve the problem. I mean, it's, you have to spend some time understanding those classes of games, okay? But even this game, the proof is not so trivial, okay? Most of the, uh, many Nobel Prize winners have worked on this particular problem and so we get the solution in this simplified form, okay? But it really requires a lot of effort to solve this problem. Any other question? The new books are being announced this week. So. Oh, really? In economics as well? I only looked up for physics. So. Yeah, physics I know it's been announced, but I think econ economics Nobel Prize is announced one month later, so somewhere in November. But maybe I'm wrong. I, I don't know. Okay. So, um, so any other question? So everyone understands this this result. Okay, this is the main result. Uh, which culminated, I mean this is, I think it was proved in 1970s, if I'm not wrong. Okay. Okay, by the way, I want to make another comment. Uh, how many of you are from communications background and have taken information theory before? A few? Okay, so you might have, you, you might remember the time sharing argument that you make in the rate distortion theory, do you remember? Right, so if, if a R1 is achievable and R2 is achievable, then any combination of R1 plus R2 is achievable, any convex combination, right? And how do you prove that result? You say that, well, uh, you, communicate at the rate R1 for some time and then communicate at R2 for some time and then overall rate is convex combination of R1 and R2. So this, in this game, player one is going to do something similar. He has to bluff, okay? He has to play according to some bluffing strategy. So he is going to play for some time according to this mu1 and he's going to play for some time according to this mu2, okay? And mu is here, this is the true distribution. So so sometimes he plays according to mu1, sometimes he plays according to mu2, and in the process he can get this payoff, okay? If it was a finite game, he can only act according to mu. 
But because it's an infinite game, he has infinite number of times that he can take an action. He can play according to mu1, get a positive payoff, play according to mu2, get a positive payoff, and then by that virtue, he can get a convex combination of every payoff here, right? So at mu, he will get the payoff right here. By an appropriate choice of time, he is going to play according to mu1 and play according to mu2. So that's the time sharing argument. And it's very similar. So in games also, you use the similar argument, similar time sharing argument. But uh, what I see is that the book has noted it in a very different manner. So the time sharing happens at time t equals 1, and then it doesn't happen at any point of time. So we'll get to that in a minute. But there is a connection between what you see here and what you know from communications and other, uh, other fields. So remember, we were talking about the games with asymmetric information. And we had introduced this belief function, pi t, which is a function on of the state, right, which is k, the private information of player 1, which is also k, and the private information of player 2, which is nothing in this case. So pi t is a function of k given h t, and that's equal to pi of t given k, h t minus 1, i t minus 1, j t minus 1. OK? How can you compute this belief? Well, you compute the probability of k comma i t minus 1, j t minus 1 over, oh, given h t, <coughs> given phi k i t minus 1, j t minus 1, given h t minus 1, summation over all k. OK, if we were doing optimization, this would be called Bayesian optimization. But we are not doing optimization. so. Uh, but you know, you might have heard Bayesian optimization, Bayesian learning, and so on and so forth. All of that is very similar to just massaging Bayes theorem, okay? Which is what we are doing now. So let's focus on this. So if we know the numerator, then denominator is fine. So what's the probability of k i t minus one, j t minus one, given? h t minus 1, that's equal to i t minus 1 given h t minus 1 k probability of j t minus 1 given h t minus 1. And what else? Probability of k. Probability of k given h t minus 1. Okay? Is this, is this step clear to everyone? Okay, this is just base rule. So given h t minus 1, I want to find this probability. So I know that i t minus 1 and j t minus 1 are independent given h t minus 1 and k. So, so that's why I've separated it into two parts. OK, this is the strategy of player 1. This comes from strategy of player 2. And this comes from the prior distribution at time t minus 1. So this is equal to gamma 1 t minus 1 of h t minus 1 k evaluated at i t minus 1 into gamma 2 t minus 1. Okay, so this is the belief. 
So this is this probability and then you can get pi t as a function of gamma 1 t, gamma 1 t minus 1, gamma 2 t minus 1 and pi t minus 1. Okay, so you know how to update the belief in this particular game. Okay, now if I restrict, so if gamma 1t is in nr mu, remember if gamma 1t was a non revealing strategy at pi t, sorry, at pi t, then so this is the fact if player 1 used a non revealing strategy at pi t then pi t plus 1 equals pi t okay so the belief doesn't change what is the belief at time 1 where there is no history so pi of k or pi 1 of k at h1 which is null set it's equal to mu, right? So if if gamma one t was n r pi t for all t, then pi t equals to mu for all t. Okay. So these are basic facts. Okay. If if the player one chooses to play non-revealing strategy at every point of time, then the belief of player two is not going to change at all. Okay, it's going to remain uh, mu at all time steps. Okay, so that allows me. So with this uh, background. we can get to the sort of an outline of the proof even though it's not really a complete proof and requires much more analysis the outline of the proof is as follows so step one is play n r game or play repeated game over n r mu cross delta n okay so since pi t is not going to change every time every at every point of time player 1 is going to play according to some non revealing strategy and define step 2 define r of gamma 1 gamma 1 bar as well you know gamma 1 is let me say gamma 1 t and gamma 1 t bar as equals to the expected value of one norm of gamma 1 t k minus summation mu k gamma 1 t k sum over all k okay and I'm going to define this as gamma 1 bar t Okay, so what is this gamma 1 t of k? That's the, that's a probability vector over the action set of player 1 and this is the mean of the probability vectors over all particular states. Okay, and what I'm saying is, not what I'm saying, 
but this is the expected value of the difference between what the actual strategy is and what the mean of the strategy is. Okay, one norm. And this basically captures, this captures, captures revelation of information. from P1 to P2, okay, this quantity. I mean, of course, if he was playing according to non-revealing strategy, then this is going to be equal to zero, okay? So what you get, what you can show actually is R of gamma one, gamma one bar is going to be equal to zero if and only if gamma one of T is in the non-revealing strategy at mu. Okay, so so that's a, that's a very easy result to prove because if this is equal to zero, it means gamma one t of k is equal to the equal to the mean, which means that uh, all gamma one t k's are equal for every k which has positive probability. Okay. And then what you do is you prove that this is a martingale, okay? So those of you who don't know what martingale is, don't worry. What you prove is that this, the expected value of R is equal to zero at every point of time, okay? Given the past history and the past beliefs. Not very difficult to prove. Uh, well, it is true even for non-revealing strategy. Okay, this is a martingale even for non-revealing strategy, but for re non-revealing strategy, this is equal to zero. No, what did I say? Uh, it is a martingale for every possible strategy. Okay, but for non-revealing strategy, this is equal to zero all the time. Okay. Then, then that is step one and two, and then you have to prove a series of results. So let me write down what those results are. So step three, prove one is that J mu, there exist gamma one such that J mu capital T gamma one gamma two is greater than equal to V mu for all gamma two. Okay. So no matter what strategy, there exists a strategy for player one, such that the expected payoff of T stage game with prior mu is always going to be greater than or equal to V of mu. Okay, and what's an easy way to construct such a strategy? Just don't use the information. Okay, if you don't use the information, you can always get V of mu. Okay, because every time you're playing a new game, you're forgetting everything that happened in the past and you're just playing according to a non-revealing strategy at mu. Second result, there exist gamma two such that lim inf of capital T going to infinity Vt of mu is achieved. Okay, so what does this mean? Let me plot Vt of mu as a function of t and it changes, okay? Okay, and what is lim inf? Well, lim inf is the lower envelope 
of this particular sequence as a function of t. So if I look at the lower envelope of this sequence, it will always converge to some value. Okay, let's say this is the value. What I'm saying is there exists a strategy for player two such that player two can achieve a value here, okay, very close to this point, which is the limit of t going to infinity of vt of mu. Okay, so this is this is lower envelope. of the sequence Vt of mu. Okay, and the third, any question so far on this? No? The third result that you have to prove is that Vt of mu is greater than equal to Cav of V of mu for every t greater than or equal to 1. Okay, and the fourth result. So until now, what we have found is the value, a lower bound on the value of finite stage game. Okay. So this is the lower bound. Now I'm saying, well, there exists a constant C, there exists constant C such that uh, cav of B is less than or equal to Vt of mu is less than or equal to cav of v mu plus c over square root of n or square root of capital T. Yeah. Okay, so now you see how quickly Vt of mu converges to cav of V mu. Okay, it's 1 over square root of t. That's the factor. So that, and now you take t going to infinity, the lower limit and the upper limit converges. So cav of Vt of mu converges as t goes to infinity. Okay, so these are the set of results that you need to prove. And this shows that V infinity of mu exists and V infinity of mu is equal to cav of V mu. Okay, so with, with all this uh, background, okay, so this basically says how the value of T stage game is going to converge to cav of V mu and in the limit you achieve cav of V mu. But now the question is how do you come up with a strategy that, that can achieve this value. So here is the way to come up with a strategy. So let's say Okay, this is my mu and this is my v of mu and how, how did I get v of mu? v of mu was the max over nr of mu and min over all possible gamma 2 of the expected utility. Okay, so if this was my mu, this is my mu. This is my cav of B. Let me call this mu1 and let me call this mu2. And let's say mu equals to alpha mu1 plus 1 minus alpha mu2. 
okay hmm so player 1 is going to play as follows at at time 1 he defines another random variable l which is equal to 1 and 2 and at t equals to 1 it plays a lottery so let's say it plays a okay at so uh, the probability distribution over L is, what should I call it? Let's say C, alpha 1 minus alpha. Okay, uh, if there were more points, if there was mu 1, mu 2, mu 3, mu 4, so you have to expand this set of L accordingly and you have to expand this uh, vector zeta, not zeta, psi accordingly, and then at t equals to 1, uh, get sample L from C, K from mu, and play gamma 1 star t, not gamma 1 star t. Uh, gamma 1 t no gamma 1 1 a 1 is sampled according to gamma 1 1 of k comma l but uh, what do i mean this will be in nr mu L. Or, okay, gamma 1 star k from nr mu L. Okay, so it's a compound lottery. Okay, first he decides, first player 1 decides which of these mu's he wants to play according to. So he, let's say he picks mu 2. Okay, that's the uh, that's the belief he wants the other player to have. So he's going to pick mu2. He's going to look at this set nr mu2, find out what the optimal strategy of what the saddle point equilibrium strategy is in this space, okay? And then play according to that for all the time steps, okay? So in this case, if you look at it from player 2's perspective, player 1 is doing this lottery, right? So player 2 doesn't know this extra state that player one has introduced artificially in this particular game. So player two will never be able to find out whether he's playing according to mu one or mu two or mu three or whatever, right? And he's going to get the expected payoff. Uh, in the expectation, he's going to essentially achieve this, this point. His payoff will be here, okay, in expectation. So that's what the strategy of player two, player one is, and then player two is just going to form the belief. So he already has a belief mu. So he's going to act according to best response according to this non-revealing game. Whatever his best response was in the non-revealing game, he's just going to act according to that strategy at all the time. Okay, and then you can prove that from the Blackwell's approachability result, which we had proved in the, not proved, but which I had introduced in the previous class, you can use that to prove that player two can achieve this, uh, this value, cav of v mu, player two can achieve this value. Okay, so what's the important result? The first is the set of payoffs that player one can get is maximized in this game. Uh, the second result is, if you want to characterize the equilibrium behavior at mu, you essentially have to characterize the equilibrium behavior over the entire space of mu. Okay, is that, is that clear? If you want to find what the value at mu is, you need to know what the value at 
at this point is, you need to know what the value at this point is, at this point is, this point is, and so on, okay, over the entire set of mu's. So that's a very interesting thing uh, in this particular game, because you can't really characterize the equilibrium at a specific point, you need to know the entire equilibrium set, okay? And since P2 knows that P1 is going to bluff, it's going to play according to the strategy that's constructed in the Blackwell's approachability result, okay? That proof for something that was not given in the classroom, but that's how player two is going to behave, okay? So any questions so far on this? So what is, so let's see from an engineering perspective what is important here. So if you're looking at an adversary and you're observing the actions of the adversary, the adversary must be playing according to a non-revealing strategy. So you won't be able to know what the adversary's information is, okay? And so if the adversary is not using a non-revealing strategy, then you can infer over a period of time what information adversary has. Okay, and that's what many of these engineering systems try to do. If you are trying to game the market, you have to act according to a non-revealing strategy, okay? If you look at electricity market, for instance, the market runs for every hour, every five minutes, every 10 minutes, every 15 minutes, and so on, okay? So it's like an infinite game because you're going to play that game every five minutes over the entire 30, 40, 50 years over the life of the generator, okay? So if there is some information that is concealed that the player has not informed you what his generator is, what kind of cost is, what's the generator cost and so on, you can infer from the bids, which is the action of a generator in the market using this idea, where you update the belief based on whatever information you have, whatever bids you have seen from that particular generator. Okay, so it's, and if you can update the belief in a very strategic manner, you can improve the payoff that you can get uh, at, every, at every point of time, okay? Uh, or rather, I should say the average payoff over a long horizon, you can improve it by making use of that information that you are accruing from the other players. So this is uh, all I have for, for, the, for the lack of, in, for repeated games with incomplete information where one player doesn't know what the, uh, one player doesn't know what the, uh, what the state is. You can have repeated games where there is lack of information on the both sides. And so there the result is very similar. Uh, v infinity of mu1, mu2 is equal to cav of cav over mu, no, cav vex of v mu1, mu2, okay? And v of mu1 <coughs> and mu2 is nr max over nr mu1 and min over nr mu2, okay? And this would be equal to vex cav v mu1 mu2, okay? Vex is the convexification function. So in this case, it's the lower envelope, okay? It's the lower envelope that is convex and is below the function itself. Oh, this is not here. Okay, so this is my vex. So many a times these two things are not equal in which case the v infinity, v infinity would not exist. But if these two things are equal, if cav vex is equal to vex cav of this value, then v infinity would exist and it's equal to this particular function. So that's all I have for uh, repeated games. It's a fairly sophisticated uh, uh, field, uh, but it's very, good because you see how the information or how the belief gets updated and how you can actually infer the information of the other player by looking at its, by looking at its action.
Any question? Yeah. Uh, line? No, it's not the straight line. So see, this is a two-dimensional function. Okay, so you will have something like a surface. Okay, something like this. And so in one direction you are concavific you are doing concavification, on the other side you are doing convexification. Okay, so it's a very weird looking function. And this may not hold. Okay, and cav is with respect to what? Cav is with respect to mu one, which is the maximizer, and vex is with respect to mu two, which is the minimizer. Okay, so in mu one, so if this is the mu one direction, then you con con concavify it. And this is your mu2 direction, so you have to convexify it. So somehow it should look something like this. Okay. Uh, so that's the idea. Any other question? No? Okay. We'll meet on uh, Thursday. On Thursday, I'm planning to do the review lecture. So we'll cover everything that we have done so far.